I'm making a PowerPoint here and I'm going to include sample excerpts from case studies because some of you asked for more specific models. Um, I know I had the findings excerpts in the dissertation and the record of study in the article, but I think some of you maybe wanted um, maybe some examples of other sections of the document and so I went through and I pieced a few things together that might be helpful for you. So let's go ahead and, and get started on on the elements. Um, and, and I'm going to talk about the, the elements, um, but you might find that you put them in different order. Let's talk about that. So of course I put a coffee pot here because I know it's going to take a lot of coffee to get the final product done and I, I, ha I have no um, illusions about that, so best of luck. And uh, so in the introduction, one of the things you're going to do is introduce the problem or the issue, and you're going to include a clear statement of the purpose of the study and the research question. They may be self-evident. You may not need both of them, but um, it doesn't hurt to put both. And a lot of case studies open with a vignette or some kind of scene, and that's a strategy you may or may not want to use. Uh, that scene could come from your field notes. It could from be, be from... Uh, your reflexive journal, there are lots of places that that could come from, and we can talk about that a little later. Also, I want to um, have a caveat here. I'm going to talk about the elements that need to be in the document. I'm not necessarily suggesting a structure or a template that you will fill in. There might be, uh, it might make sense to blend two of the, the, the sections or go a little bit out of order. Um, you will have an introduction and you will have a conclusion, but within the body itself, you know, there are all kinds of possibilities and you're just going to have to choose what works best for you and for your reader. And you want to think about your audience. Is your uh, and always keep the audience in mind. Is your audience going to be able to follow your ideas in the way you're presenting them? That's the most important thing to think about. Is you know um, this is what I want to say, and I'm interacting with the text. But when the audience interacts with the text, are they going to understand the way this is put together? Now, before I show you the next slide. I, uh, I'm going to suggest, this is the way we, we do this. I'm going to show you long excerpts of text. And I'm not going to read those out loud. I'm going to have you read those silently and then I'm going to just go over and talk about some of the elements or some of the things that you might notice in the text. So when I advance to this next slide, I want you to stop the presentation, read what's on the text, and then start the presentation back and then I'll discuss it. That way everybody can read at their own pace and we don't have to worry about jumping ahead. Okay, you ready to go? So in this intro excerpt, and as you can tell, I think I've, I guess I had a spoiler alert early in the semester, uh, the study I did a long time ago, I went ahead and dug it out of the musty closet and um, so because, you know, I, I, you know, some of you wanted a model and I, and I wanted to choose something that, you, that might be helpful to you and more specific to what you were doing. So in this, uh, this intro starts with a vignette, as you can tell. Where did that vignette come from? The vignette comes from the reflexive journal, the field notes, all of the things. Um, and if you're good at taking notes along the way, um, this comes pretty easy, um, although um, honestly, um, in terms of writing the piece, you don't necessarily need to write the introduction first in the draft. Uh, it's m kind of difficult sometimes to come up with a good intro off the top of your head. Um, but anyway, that's kind of a side note. So in that is a vignette. It also refers to the researcher's positionality. Uh, it talks about the fact that the researcher is embedded in this community. So you have the positionality. It contextualizes by time, okay? And it talks about um, perceptions in the media. 
you don't really see those perceptions much anymore. I mean, that was just a, a big deal. That term was a big deal when I when I did this piece. Okay, and then I've omitted some material. This is a you know much longer piece. Omitted material, some data excerpts, and then boom, right here. You don't have to be shy. You don't have to be subtle. The intent of this case study, and just say it as a sentence. Okay, all right, and then I leave out the data, and then. I, that's my end of my conclusion in this in that last sentence. Okay. All right. Introduction. Context. The audience needs context. The audience needs to know what the problem or issue is. The audience needs to know what you're going to do about it, how you're going to explore this. And that leads then to the next section, which is the method. Okay, in the methods, of course, you go back to the philosophical assumptions, like I haven't said that before, right? But one of the, th these are several, these are a few of the most important things you want to think about, including your methods. And you're going to really uh, use a lot of detail here as well. Right? Lots and lots of detail in the methods. You're going to, and I, this is going in no certain order, no certain order whatsoever. But you're going to look at your positionality. What is your positionality? Okay, are you, you know, um, I mean, where are you suited in this organization, this phenomenon, or whatever? You're going to address or bracket any issues you have, any biases, okay? You need to note how you bounded the study, how and why you bounded the study the way you did. You're going to say, how did, I, how did you choose participants? How did you decide how many participants to choose? How did you decide who, who, who to interview, who not to interview, okay? How did you do that? If you use... Uh, Snowball sampling, um, describe how that happened or how that came to be. Okay? That's a really great technique. I, I would suggest if you didn't use it that time, this time, some of your best interviews will come from the snowball, uh, even as opposed to the original list. What's your interview strategy? Okay? You're taking hand field notes, you're recording. You know, you're not recording for this piece, but in, in, in the future. What are your questions? You describe taking the field notes, how you did it, how you transcribed. Okay, so I sent them off to a transcriptionist, or I typed up my field notes, or I typed up my interview notes and put them in Excel, and then I colored the cells. You know, how did you, how did you transcribe? How did you code the data? And every detail is, is really important. Show how you protect the participants. How did you do that? Okay. Um, how and why did you keep a reflexive journal? And then any kind of evaluation methods, I have a, 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 um, a, a, you know, triangulation may be one of the things that you may have used. You may not have had time to use any. I'm sure you didn't have time to use methods checks, uh, member checks, I mean. But uh, think, think about all of those things. And a lot of you saying, I'm not going to get 25 pages out of this. Well, I think you're going to really struggle to keep it to 25 pages, and that's why I put it there. Now, I've got the next slide is an excerpt. So when we split the slides, stop the presentation, read it, and then we'll talk about it. Okay, so in the first paragraph, you will see um, the way um, the participants were chosen. And it's not, me it's mechanical, but it's also intentional. So um, you say, I want to talk to people who all think the same thing or whatever. But one of the things that is uh, evident in the first paragraph here is seeking out people with a wide variety of thoughts and feelings so that you explore the boundaries of what you're thinking. And one of the things this is, can do for you also is you have questions. You, you do the best you can, but you have preset questions. You're the researcher's instrument. So you're thinking of the questions from your perspective. But talking to people may suggest, and we're all committed to emergent design, but talking to people then may suggest new questions that you hadn't even considered or thought of, okay? Um, and then what was the positionality or what was the perspective? So even if you're asking, I say, even if you're asking about how did the daughter feel, you know it's filtered to the mother's thoughts. So it's really interviewing the mothers, okay, about their perspective of how the daughter is feeling. And there's no illusion there. The daughter might not feel the same way at all, okay? but that's not the point. Okay? 
And then you acknowledge your mistakes. Hey, what went wrong? What made it messy? It's so messy, qualitative research, okay? Um, and one mistake here is dropping a question, then realizing maybe dropping it was extreme, maybe rephrasing it, maybe putting it in a later in the interview. All of those things come through your reflexive neural, and that's why it's important, okay? Here's some, here's another, this is a um, continuation of the excerpt, so when we advance the slides, stop, read this, and then I'll talk about it. Okay, so here's the next section, and this is a little more mechanical. This is actually how this was done. Took field notes during the interviews, typed them up, converted them. See, there's a lot of detail here. Okay. Printed the cards, and um, probably there's some more detail that could be in this last paragraph, I think, because you can say how many times you went through the cards, you can show, or your, your Excel file, how did you sort and resort and resort, because a one time through is not gonna, uh, not gonna work. And then talking about the categories that come up. Now, as you can see, this is in the methods section, or the methods ex excerpt. Some people might say, gosh, wouldn't the categories, w when you talk about the categories, wouldn't that be in the presentation of the findings? That's why I'm saying that this is not necessarily uh, the order that I'm telling you to go in. What's going to make sense for you? Now, for this particular piece, the next section is the presentation of the findings. The next section starts with, when did the daughter start playing? So it's almost a transition to the next section. Okay. So here's presentation of the findings next. And so you're not going to put be able to put all your data in. Um, you're, you're going to put data in that is representative, but you're not going to leave out people who disagree. So when we read the presentation of the findings, and I'm going to skip to another study um, for the presentation of the findings because I didn't really want to share uh, data um, from that last study, so I'm going to skip to another study. But you're looking at, let's answer the question. Let's answer the research question. And then we're going to go through the categories or the themes that emerge that answer those questions, OK? You only have one question, so you can take out your categories and then go. You can go in order, and those are headings, subheadings, 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 and answer the, um, answer the question. When you do a longer piece, like a record of study or a dissertation, you'll have several research questions. So you can answer the research question, and if the categories fall in line, these categories answer this question versus these categories answer this question, you can do that. Okay? But I'm jumping ahead. Let's just talk about how to get this particular assignment done, right? All right. Um, so you, you also uh, want to think about how you're going to identify your participants. Um, you can aggregate the data. You don't want, you want to protect them. You want to, you, you know, if it's not going to be obvious who they are, you can just rename them and put context individually. But you could also aggregate them. You could put a little table in uh, and, and aggregate them. You could put that in the methods section if you wanted to, too. Okay. Now, hopefully, you've designed your interview questions from your research question so it sets you up for the categories. But that's not always the case, but you never know. All right, um, and then you want to frame the data with the context and then the representative data samples. Now the next page uh, is going to, this is pretty long to tell you the truth, it's three slides long. So we're going to take one slide at a time, I'm going to advance the slide, you stop and read this sli one slide, we'll talk about it, then go to the next one and the next one, because I wanted to show you the elements of writing uh, and, and presenting data that might be helpful for you, okay? So we're going to advance to the next slide, stop the presentation, read, and then we'll pick up the discussion. Okay, so here's an excerpt from findings in a, a different study. So it's not about soccer, all right? Even though the word coach is in here. Okay. So uh, in this particular piece, there needs to have context, okay? Uh, learning communities have, uh, communities have members and activity, they have structure, and they have roles. Okay, so what we're going to talk about in this next section is what do faculty C 
see their how do faculty see their roles in helping students uh, and what do they call themselves okay so the so um, and I did refer to here the theoretical framework but you don't have to worry about that this overlays a framework on the piece but um, it says faculty see their role as mentor well how do we know that well we say Troy used the term coach five times in the interview as he described his work with students all right I think that coach label works I work hard to let them know on their side so that's the excerpt okay that kind of shows not tells okay so in the Troy used the term coach five times in the interview as he described his work with students that's telling the excerpted data shows the next one Lars also used the word guide so it's still a mentorship but they pick, he picked a different word my role is trusted guide okay so I'm telling here Lars showing trusted guide okay now the next excerpt is going to take a turn the word however indicates a transition to the opposite okay so I'm gonna go to the next slide y'all read it stop the presentation read it and then we'll talk about the strategies you use to from to, to from going to one topic to the next or to show dissonance or um, you know um, contradictions okay so here the however indicates going in a different direction so faculty define themselves as mentors all right but if uh, if they are in a dispute with a student over an honor code violation the honor code office calls the faculty the accuser all right so they're no longer the guide the trusted guide or the coach now they're the accuser well how do faculty feel about that right in terms of switching their positionality so you can tell it right you can tell it well they felt bad or they didn't like it but you can show it and so in the next excerpt it says Paul was shocked I mean at the beginning of the at last of that first paragraph Paul was shocked to hear himself described as the accuser when he attended an honor code violation hearing and then you have the 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 exact words of that piece okay and to be honest we'll see that was a that was a mistake I should also uh, divide the paragraph up and um, show where the end of the quote is okay? but you can probably tell that okay so he was placed in position so I've got what we've got here is that we've got the discrepancy the data excerpt and the explanation of the data excerpt okay the next slide is um, another piece of the data finding so I'm going to go ahead and, and fast forward and y'all can read it and then we'll talk about what elements of writing are in there and here we're going right back to the data the representative data okay and um, we're telling a story okay this is the way the faculty sees him or herself themselves this is the way the faculty sees themselves in terms of the rules this is what happens when an honor code violation happens and how do they feel afterwards all right now look at the next uh, the last paragraph on that slide and I, and I showed you all this when we went through the um, the article and the record of study we're going to the next person and we've got a transition there just as Paul expressed concern about his role in working with students after a violation Emily talked about what happens to the student after he or she has been found guilty of plagiarism by the University Honor Code Office she reflected that once students are accused of plagiarism particularly those who have violations so so it is the same but we're not talking about roles anymore we are talking a little bit about roles but now we're kind of pivoting and saying 
what happens to the relationship once that you know that role is is violated what happens to the relationship between teacher and student okay so I've got another sample excerpt I think this is the last one so go ahead and stop the slide when I advance it uh, stop the presentation when I advance the slide and then we'll talk about it okay so let's talk about this so this idea of role of accuser then this faculty member is noting that it stunts the ability of the student to develop as academic writers and so I've so you you know that we've got the telling there this idea that this is what happens when a student has been accused and then the data excerpt right after and why pick that one one it's 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 a vivid story right that right there is the worst thing I have seen in my entire life and I've had and that is the words of the faculty member you know it, it has a rhythm it has a, a beat all of its own and it's it's you know it's compelling so you're going to go through your data and you're going to find what is compelling right what tells this and you don't want to you, you, you want to be sincere you 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 need to say okay well this counters that so I'm gonna put that in too not everybody's gonna have the same perspective then after the data excerpt then you have a summation you don't just go right on to the next data excerpt or to the next topic you you want a, a you know it's like a sandwich you have a slice of bread that introduces it then you have the meat which is the data excerpt and then you've got another piece of bread because it's not a sandwich without that concluding uh, statement. Okay, now let's go on to interpretation of findings. Again, this may be folded into some of your presentation of the uh, results, but let's talk about it. What do these findings mean? Are there implications for practice? And, you know, you want to be careful. You don't want to say, well, everybody should do this or everybody should do that. We don't want to generalize that way. But in terms of, you know, wh what what knowledge or meaning comes out of, of the, the data you've collected. So again, I've got a, a sample. I'm going to advance the slide. You read this excerpt and I think we're going, we're going back to soccer this time. Okay, so read it and we'll talk about it. Okay, so here we say, okay, there's a hint of truth. There are women who try to overcome. Okay. And then what did I learn? What did what 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 do you, what did you learn in this case study? What did you learn? You know, what did you discover? What's what what's happening? So make meaning of it. Just be sure you're making meaning of it through the data and not going off on a rant. I think there's a difference between those two things. Like, okay, now I get to say my part, but it needs to be tied to the the data. The data need to speak, you know, and, and you'll draw those conclusions from the data. All right. Next section, reflections on experience. Reflections on experience. Now, you know, uh, this is also a, um, this is an example from a previous, that's why I'm saying the, the order may not matter. And the order needs to make sense in the, in the way you're telling the story and presenting the data. But what happened? What went wrong? What went right? What kind of insights did you have? What kind of surprises did you have? Um, all these things can go in this piece. Um, what kind of things, what are you going to do next time? You know, um, you know what, what are the possibilities? What did you learn? It's just an, just an honest reflection on, on the process. And, wow. and it's part of qualitative research. It's not just filler. That reflection is, is important. Okay? And then you're going to have a conclusion. And really what you're going to do is you, you just remind the reader of the issue, layer the conclusion with the meaning. If you have a, if you did have a vignette to start with, you could return to the, the vignette. Um, just wrap it up. You've got lots and lots. You can re kind of remind the reader of, of those, those main points. Just kind of go back to the beginning and, and make sure it has a nice,
clean conclusion, not a long conclusion. It doesn't have to be long, but you don't want to leave your reader hanging like, oh, is it over? Right? We've all had those experiences watching TV or a movie or something like that. Make sure they say, oh, okay, all right, huh, that was great. Okay. So hopefully that's been helpful. Um, best of luck to you. Let me know if you have any questions. Uh, apologies for this being so late, but um, I wanted to make sure. I thought the, the other model would be good enough, but it seems seems like, yeah, I agree. This You probably want some more information, and hopefully this will, this will help you out.